You know, my name is Ash Repstein. I'm the managing director of the Dingman Center for Entrepreneurship. I want to talk about the uh, future of information in education. And I want to start with what I call an entrepreneurial truism. Package, timely information has value. Bloomberg, stock quotes, there's value there. Kelly Blue Book, how much a used car is worth, value. The weather report, the news, there's value. Uh, you know, what's going on around the world right now? What's going on with your friends? The 800 million people Hassan just rec mentioned. You know, these activities all generate value from packaging, timely information. So, you know, in the U.S., we have this perspective that anybody can create information from anywhere at any time and deliver it to anyone else. Information is available and it's accessible. Now, the Chinese model is a different model. The Chinese model, information is controlled at the top and it's given down on a need-to-know basis. I do a lot of work in China. You know, a couple years ago, we were looking at opportunities for credit bureaus. There were one million people in the country of China that had a credit score. That was not information that anyone else needed to put together and assemble. You know, there's lots of other information that if you need to get access, you go to one source, the government source, and that's the only source, and it's very, very hard to validate. In India, information's available, but it's at your fingertips. It's the fiber optics, it's the connection to the internet. It's accessing the information because the information's out there. And so the lessons that we learn is that the value creation happens from getting the right information at the right time from a trusted source. That's where the value is created. And so when we think about the future of education, you know, rote memorization is dead. I mean, why do you need to memorize facts when you can go to Google or someplace else on the web and pull them up better, more accurately from more sources than whatever your second or third or eighth grade teacher might have taught you? And this information is always available. It's out there. And when you think about the China and India model, you know, they'll be able to access and process information better, faster, cheaper than we will here. You can throw 10 people at the problem in China for the price of one. You can throw 10 people or more in, at India for working on the same problem for the price of one. So the, the access to the information is not the competitive advantage. So where can we have the premium here? You know, we want to create high value jobs in this country we want to create growth, we want to create economic development. Where can we capture the premium in the U.S.? So the model is really, it's this creativity, it's the thinking, it's the learning, it's the processing, it's the analysis. It's the high value thought skills, plus the ability to communicate that to the right person at the right time. That's the combination of the skill set that we need to be able to foster and develop in this country. Because getting access to the information is not the value add. Processing and delivering in a way that is solving a problem for somebody else at the right time and right place is where the premium comes from. And that's where we want to focus in this country. So when we talk also a little bit about innovation, you know, we're never going to regain the lead in innovation in this country. Innovation has been distributed around the world. There's two smart people that can innovate anywhere and create a new idea. But the premium is not in the new idea. The premium is in creating the value to solve a problem, getting the technology or the solution to the market. The U.S. still does sales, marketing, financing, and scale of ideas and businesses better than anyone else in the world. That's our premium. So the trick is how do we find the right information, the right innovation from elsewhere and take it to the markets in the way that we know how to do in areas where we have competitive advantages? So, you know, what's missing here? Well, the first thing is missing is this refocus on the skills where we have the competitive advantage. The creativity example that you just heard, I mean, that's, that really is a good illustration. Where can we focus the education system to teach students so that they realize this is a globally competitive world and that it's no longer competing against the 35 kids in your class or the, you know, 37,000 students at your university, but it's, it's competing against the 800 million other people in India and China and middle class positions who want the same opportunities and can access those same opportunities from elsewhere. 
And the second skill set is the entrepreneurial skill set. It's the opportunity recognition part of the equation. It's how do I know when there's an opportunity for me to package up this information that I've observed, that I've structured, that I've analyzed, that I've processed, and deliver it to solve a timely problem for somebody from a trusted source at the right time and place. So, you know, we have lost the uh, energy and appreciation for opportunity in this country. There were too many years of plenty, and the mentality was, oh, I missed that train, there'll be another train in five or ten minutes. When you go to China, and we run business plan competitions in China, we've done this now for seven years in a row, that we work with Peking University, which is the number two university in China. Just to apply to Peking University, you have to score in the top 1% of your GMAT and SAT equivalents, just to apply. So the students there, when they're competing for opportunity in, in, to get some money, to get some recognition, to get differentiated from their peers, it's unbelievable. They get up, they compete, and they cry when they win this competition. And so that's part of the skill set that we need to be able to teach students, is that opportunity never comes packaged up in a perfect box with a bow handed you on a silver plate. That's not how opportunity exists. Opportunity is dirty and ugly and messy, and you have to roll up your sleeves and work and uncover where the value is, because if it wasn't dirty, ugly, and messy, everybody else would be chasing it and it would disappear. So the value that we can create is from solving problems. It's not just from recognizing problems. It's not just from coming up with ideas or coming up with technology. It's from solving a problem for an end customer. And when we talk about problems, we talk about problems as aspirin or vitamins. Aspirin are problems that are pounding problems that need solutions now. That's the type of problem you want to be able to solve. And this entrepreneurial skill set we believe is critical for the future of the education and information because recognizing opportunities to solve problems where people are having pain and that's where you can have the premium. So it's this opportunity recognition and the critical thought analysis to deliver a solution is where we can get the competitive and maintain a competitive advantage in the US. So I think from a conclusion we need to reinvent and become more innovative in our curriculum across the K through 12 and also at the higher ed. You know, higher ed trends are not encouraging. Unemployment is high among recent grads. The cost of tuition outpaces the cost of inflation. Universities are having severe budget cuts both in public and private. They're top heavy models. You know, there's overcrowding in class. The online of the for-profit universities are delivering four credit hours at a much lower price point. And the technical degrees, there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal about how the hedge fund industry is willing to buy the bonds of people who go to two-year technical degrees because the payback on that is a much uh, surer investment opportunity than someone who gets a law degree because we are way over lawyered in this country. So understanding and innovating and looking at the problems and coming up with a new model to compete effectively in the world. So that's... Uh, that's the high level on information in education. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm at the Dingman Center, and uh, this is how you can find me below on uh, Google, Asher Repstein, Maryland, LinkedIn, and email. Thank you. Thank you, Asher. So my question is, having been at the university for eight years and sitting here in an industry that I think has many of the symptoms of the newspaper industry of 10 years ago, how do we communicate a sense of urgency that this is a problem that we need to fix today and not wait uh, another 5, 10, 15 years until the pain is obvious and uh, aspirin's not going to solve it? You, you put your finger on one of the classically difficult things of all futurists. It's easy in many cases to show where the curve is going to go and to say, if you don't do this, you're going to be in a world of yogurt. And yet people don't take action until something actually is happening in their daily lives. So I, I don't actually know the problem to this, but it's a common problem. Anybody, anybody else have a better idea than that? You have to show people the value of acting. I mean, they have to get something out of acting. Um, again, I think this came up last night. Sometimes you have to make the problem small enough that people feel like they could actually do something to fix it. Um, you know, if you state the problem this way, you know, our educational system is falling apart, you know, it's doom and gloom. People just go, oh yeah, we know, we've been hearing that. 
you know, what can I possibly do? But I think if you make it smaller, you find that one problem like the dirt that, you know, you know you can actually figure out a way to make that solvable or at least um, sensational, um, maybe, maybe you'll get more people to act. Do we really have a problem? I mean, if you look at the number of businesses that are started and new things that are tried in this country versus other countries, phenomenally ahead, phenomenally ahead. You go to Europe and there are not a lot of startups. They just don't do it. Go through Asia and they're just not looking for those types of opportunities. It's very ingrained. I don't know, like you, well, you tell me. Do we have a problem on a relative basis yeah. or an absolute basis? <laughs> Take yeah, your pick. Europe is not my metric for success these Me days. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. No, they're done. They got tweet, the. Tweet you that, know. please. Yeah. <laughs> Asher Epstein EP. <laughs> I think what Asher was saying is that he saw real differences between the Chinese students and what he sees here in our country. Yeah, the hunger. Like, they, they really are trying to economically change their lives. And, and in terms of absolute numbers, I, I think you, you're absolutely right. Um, the numbers were 1.3 billion in China, 1.1 billion in uh, 1. India. 1.6, 1. 1.6. Excuse me, I didn't update recently. Um, uh, 300 million in the United States, or, or point, put it this way, 0. 0.3 billion in the United States. I mean, several futurists have projected that in 2025 there will be more English speakers in China mm -hmm. than in the rest of the English-speaking world. So even if English is the dominant language on the net, it's going to be Chinese English. It's going to be an interesting, different kind of world. So I, I don't know that we can compete on the basis of numbers because you're right. The top 1%, or put it another way, the, the, the um, AP students in India outnumber all the students in the United States in K-12. That's a really interesting difference, and that's, a, I think, a fascinating thing to think about as we go forward. There's but. also, there's, I think there's also an energy and a hunger over there for success, and where I think what has happened in the United States, we're all somewhat in shell shock as to what has recently happened in just a few years, and people just haven't come out of that shock yet to realize that we have to respond with just as much energy and enthusiasm in our creative thought. Well, I, I'm not all doom and gloom. I mean, the Chinese have... <laughs> Allison requested controversy, so I, I like to deliver. You're doing great, Asher. <laughs> really great. Um, but, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Chinese definitely have an appreciation for opportunity well beyond what American students do. But the creativity that we see is significantly less right. than what the right, Americans have. So even with our, right. you know... Uh, degrading creativity from K through 12, it's still significant when you compare to some other parts of the world.